Good evening, everybody. Welcome one and all to our Living Room Lecture Series, and thank you for joining us. Tonight, we have a presentation on textile production in historic California by Dr. Susan Hector. My name is Adam Neasley, and I am the Public Archaeology Coordinator at the San Diego Archaeological Center. Save the date for our next Living Room Lecture with local archaeologist Richard Carrico on September 28th. More details coming soon. This Saturday, August 12th, in the center classroom is our second Saturday lecture screening, where we share some of our favorite past living room lecture presentations. This month's screening are The Fishing Link, a coastal model of the peopling of the Americas, and Geoglyphs of the Desert Southwest. Join us September 9th for the California Preservation Foundation's Foundation Doors, Doors Open California, a celebration of architecture and cultural culture featuring across over 70 historic places across the state. Explore the center's museum during our open house and go behind the scenes for a tour of the curation lab, library, and vaults. Details on this and other information about the center, our curation efforts, and promotions can be found online at sandiegoarchaeology.org. Tonight, we will be using the Q&A feature and you can find it in your Zoom control panel. Feel free to submit questions at any time and they will be answered at the end of the presentation during the moderated Q&A. I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Susan Hector. Dr. Susan Hector received her MA and PhD from UCLA in anthropology and spent her career as an archeologist and environmental project manager. Dr. Hector has received many awards, including the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Society for California Archeology span and the Excellence in Historic Preservation Award from the National Society Daughters of the American Revolution. Her work in historic preservation has been honored with three governor's awards. She co-authored SB 1034, which amended the California Environmental Quality Act to add penalties for damage to cultural resources on public lands. In her retirement, she serves on several nonprofit and corporate boards and is president of the Center for Research and Traditional Culture of the Americas. She recently served as the historian for the San Diego chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution and volunteers in Old Town San Diego's State Historic Park and at the House of Scotland in Balboa Park. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Susan Hector. Thank you. <clears throat> um, does this look okay, Adam? Everything okay? Yes, I think so. You would tell me if it wasn't. Okay, well, thank you. And thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, and uh, I'm gonna just jump right in here with this presentation. Uh, Spanish and Mexican textile traditions spread throughout what is now California when presidios, military forts, missions, churches with supporting industries, ranchos, settlements focused on grazing cattle and sheep, and pueblos, towns, were established in the late 1700s. Spinning wheels and looms were built and weaving instruction was provided. Primary documents describe how the Spanish and Mexican governments promoted the production of wool and cotton fabric critical to the survival of populations in these remote locations. In particular, blankets made of local churro wool were important trade items and were made in the thousands every year. But unfortunately, few fragments of historic textiles from this period exist. As an archeologist and craftsperson, I decided to research early historic period textiles made in California and then create my interpretation of these fabrics as an exercise in experimental archeology. span this work is part of my longtime interest in the unseen culture. Those aspects of culture and heritage that are not preserved directly in the archaeological record. Made of perishable materials, archaeologists find little evidence for the production of textiles from raw plant and animal materials. Through research and implementation of my skills as a farmer, spinner, dyer, and weaver, I wanted to bring these significant components of culture back into the light. Most of what I make is for use in Old Town San Diego State Historic Park as interpretive and museum objects. What is now Old Town San Diego was established in the early 1820s as a Pueblo where retired soldiers from the nearby Presidio built homes and raised their families. These families were part of the Californio culture. The women of Californio families combined native, 
Spanish, Mexican, and American lifestyles to make this period of American history one of our most diverse and culturally significant. This diversity is reflected in the textile traditions of the period before California became a United States territory and then a state. My presentation will focus on cotton and wool textiles made in San Diego during the Spanish and Mexican periods and demonstrate how the ongoing production and use of these fabrics represented the diversity of cultures in Southern California at the time and the persistence of traditional methods of production. I will show examples I made, including Sayal Franciscano, Perga, Sabinia, and Valleta textiles, and also describe culture embroidery made with hand spun wool yarn. Here's a brief overview of our history before we jump in. The Presidio in San Diego was established by Spain in 1769. A mission was also built, but was moved east in 1774 to avoid conflicts with the soldiers. In 1821, after years of struggle, Mexico gained independence from Spain. Towns like San Diego no longer were restricted to purchasing fabric and fibers through outlets approved by the Spanish government, but could trade with the United States, England, and other textile producing nations. This time is referred to as the Californio period, which ended when California became a United States territory in 1848 and a state in 1850. My focus in this talk is the span of years between the founding of the Presidio and Mission in 1769 and the American period, beginning in 1848 with statehood in 1850. Uh-oh. I don't know. Okay. Problem. There's always a problem, right? But we're problem solvers. Okay, let's start at the beginning with the Kumeyaay, who have lived in what is now the San Diego region since time immemorial and still live here today. I am living on Kumeyaay land near several large communities. The Kumeyaay made different types of textiles, which I will describe briefly before we get into production of cloth by the Spanish, Mexican, and American people of the region. I consider basketry and basket making to be textile production because baskets are made of specially processed fiber threads and are sewn into coils or woven into twine structures. Most of the Kumeyaay baskets are made by coiling. Some basket forms are woven structures featuring a twining technique that is very similar to weaving twill on a loom. Twined baskets are more common in Northern California. Other types of fiber plants were processed into nets, cordage, and occasionally fabric. The most important of these are milkweed and dogbane. These plants produce vast fibers, meaning the usable materials are long strands in the plant stems. Other types of vast fibers are flax and hemp, for example, and the processing of milkweed and dogbane is similar. For scale, the dogbane yarn on the right is tied with regular sized cotton string, so it, it can become very fine. Fibers from the leaves of yucca and agave plants were also extracted and used for sandals and cordage. In all of these plants, a two ply or cabled yarn was created for use. This cordage was also used to reinforce and repair pottery. Skirts, aprons, and cloaks were made from the soft inner bark of the elderberry, willow, and cottonwood trees. Yucca fiber was also used for this purpose. Strips of inner bark were tied to a waistband made of cordage, covering it completely using a lark's head knot. The strips were trimmed to length as needed. Animal materials were also used by the Kumeyaay to make textiles. Using rabbit skins twisted around applied yarn made from the plant materials mentioned above, as the warp or vertical threads, the Kumeyaay wove with cordage in a plain weave structure to create a dense warm blanket. The weaving was accomplished on a warp frame consisting of four poles set vertically into the ground. So what was the availability of imported textiles in the early historic period? 
It's not the purpose of my presentation to describe how the Industrial Revolution started with intensification of textile production, but factory production and distribution of fabric had an important influence on California textile production. By this time, there were many varieties and colors of fabric available commercially. This period is characterized by the dominance of printed cotton fabric. By the time Old Town San Diego was established in 1821, an astonishing variety of cotton fabrics was being made in Europe for the world trade in textiles. Printed cottons from India, introduced to Europe in the 1500s, created a demand for colorful and washable fabrics that were traded extensively by the mid to late 1600s. Although cotton had been known in Europe long before that time, aggressive marketing of many types and qualities of printed cotton, first from India and then from mainland Europe and England, resulted in wide availability. In the case of San Diego, while the region was a colony of Spain, the textiles were obtained, legally that is, by requisition from the port of San Blas, Mexico. Block printed cottons were referred to as Indiana or Indianias in recognition of their origins in India. After Mexican independence in 1821, fabric from worldwide trade networks arrived in San Diego at least a few times a year. When inventory was taken at Mission San Diego in 1834, many dozens of yards of printed cotton were listed as well as thimbles and sewing thread. Where did all this fabric come from? Printed cotton fabric from India was exported to Europe in large quantities by the East India Company starting in the 17th century. Almost as soon as colorful block printed fabrics arrived in Europe, mills in England, Holland, and elsewhere started copying them. These fabrics were known as calico, in reference to the Indian city Calicut. The turkey red process was a trade secret and this brilliant cloth became very popular. It is likely that most of the cotton fabric imported into San Diego after mandated trade through the port of San Blas had ended, originated in Great Britain's powerful factories with designs based on the colorful prints of India or stripes of woven colors. The United States mills did not begin producing significant quantities of cotton fabric until at least the 1820s and slowly increased production throughout the mid 1800s. So why then was California production of textiles even necessary? The answer is in a pride of self-sufficiency, non-availability non of all the types of textiles needed by residents, specifically utility textiles, the need to produce trade goods for income, and the extended delay and unreliability of shipping fabric from distant ports. A cultural heritage of creating traditional textiles also played an important role, and to a large degree guided what was made in California and what was acceptable as an import. What were the raw materials for California textile production? wool and cotton. When the Spanish founded Mission San Diego de Alcala in 1769, they arrived with their own system of producing yarns from plant and animal fibers. The animal fiber traditionally used by the Spanish was wool from sheep. Chura, a breed of sheep domesticated on the Iberian Peninsula, were hardy, adaptable, and fertile. This breed was imported to the Spanish settlements in the New World in the 1500s. Today, it is best known as the Navajo churro breed, used by the Diné people of the Southwest for fiber and meat. It was the churro sheep that were trailed to the missions and settlements from Mexico. It is likely that San Diego's churro sheep came north from the Baja missions. Mission San Diego had 32,000 head of sheep grazing on their lands during the height of the establishment. The ranchos of the region had many thousand more based on the recollections of California descendants. 
The Californias had churro shoot with many colors, which added natural variety to fabrics. The black and white could be spun separately to make a striped fabric, or the colors could be carded together to create gray. All these colors were found in fabric of the period. Hand cards to process the long silky fleece were imported into California in the late 1700s, according to inventories and requisitions. But wool combs were limited in use. Cotton was grown in San Diego at the mission as well. But cotton growing, as well as other agriculture, was not successful in San Diego until a reliable water supply was secured. Initially, the Padres believed that water from the San Diego River would be adequate for their fields and orchards. However, this was not the case, and by 1783, they decided to seek a more reliable water source. In 1795, the Padres found a spring upstream and built a dam and flume to the mission fields by 1813. The mission started growing cotton in 1819, but that year was a poor yield. In 1820, conditions improved and 14 arrobas, approximately 350 pounds, were harvested from the mission fields. But a better place was found to grow San Diego's cotton. Apollinaria Lorenzana, who supervised operations at Mission San Diego around 1820, noted that cotton for the mission was grown in San Jorge, now known as Spring Valley, in the early 19th century, and that bundles of fiber were harvested every day. It was spun into yarn and used to weave towels, napkins, and tablecloths. It's unfortunate we don't have physical evidence of cotton fabric from early historic San Diego. But based on the research I conducted for the Old Town Textile Project, we know that short staple cotton was spun on the spindle wheel and woven into towels and domestic utility textiles. My guess is that the cotton was probably creamy white or light brown in color. Let's discuss early historic production spinning and weaving at the missions and presidios. Workshops for textile production were located at every mission, since each was intended to be self-sufficient. Weaver Antonio Enrique taught weaving to the neophytes throughout the California mission system, and his native wife taught the Native American women and girls how to spin. Beginning at Mission San Diego, she taught carding, spinning, and weaving at the Southern missions. Senor Enrique made spinning wheels, warping frames, looms, combs, and taught the weaving of both woolen and cotton cloth at the Native Mission workshops. In Governor Pio Pico's narrative, he described how the female mission neophytes at Mission San Luis Rey were given wool to spin as their daily work, with the yarn turned in at the end of the day. He described how each mission had looms and weavers and many people to card and spin the wool. I'll quote Governor Pico. Before there was trade with the outside, the missions produced all the material the Indians used to clothe themselves. Each Indian was given a loincloth made of coarse material, a blanket, and a jacket made something like a shirt, also a coarse cloth made by the Indians themselves. The Indian women were given material for skirts and also a blanket and a blouse. Once a year, they were given a dress. The cowboys were only given shoes, leather pants, and a shirt of coarse cloth. Afterwards, it was customary to purchase from the ships many things for the Indians. Among them were unbleached muslin, flannel, and printed calico. The San Diego Weaving Workshop founded by the mission was still active in 1848 according to the diaries of Judge Benjamin Hayes. Although no longer located at the mission, fabric was still being produced. This activity was halted by the American military takeover in 1849. To further my understanding of the textile production history of San Diego, I researched what types of fabric were available in the stores located in Old Town. 
I've read several ledgers and accounting books from the 1850s and 1860s to see what was being bought and sold. The dominant yardage sold was muslin, calico, and wool twill flannel, just like Governor Pinto mentioned. This limited choice may have prompted the production of other utility textiles. I'd like to talk now a little bit about my research on California spinning and weaving. The Living History Program at La Parisima State Historic Park includes traditional colonial Hispanic looms and spinning wheels appropriate for the early 1800s. Some years ago, I contacted staff at La Parisima to request information on the reproduction spinning wheels used at the park. Of the three spinning wheels at La Parisima, two were made by the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC, around 1939 based on a spinning wheel housed at the Santa Fe Museum in New Mexico. The original construction plans were provided to me. Michael Sampson and I decided to try to locate that original wheel in New Mexico History Museum in Santa Fe. Unfortunately, we were told that the wheel used to make the CCC plans is no longer in the collections. The wheel currently in the collections is similar in construction, so that was the one that we used to draw up our plans. Museum staff suggested that we look at other historic examples of Spanish colonial spinning wheels located at Casa San Isidro in Corrales and Las Golondrinas in Santa Fe. All of these circa 1800 wheels are good examples of the equipment that was probably used at the mission in San Diego. But what happened to the Mission San Diego spinning wheels? It was the intent of the Mexican government that the goods of the former missions should be sold off at secularization in 1834. Mission San Diego's inventory at the time listed six looms, 16 spinning wheels, 12 pairs of hand cards, and three hand combs, two for flax and one for wool. Many of these tools probably remained in the active workshop founded by the mission until 1849. One loom was loaned out. The Estudios took some of the mission items and it is likely that spinning wheels ended up with old town families where spinning was not done in workshops, but was an important activity for the community. This research resulted in the production of a replica California spinning wheel for old town paid for with donations. Thank you very much. I used the wheel to spin churro wool for weaving. This wheel was made by Paul Healy, who's a local craftsman from the plans we made during our New Mexico research. In addition to the spinning wheel, hand spindles were also used. Slower by the hour, but faster by the day, a hand spindle is a portable tool that can be carried by the spinner to produce yarn anywhere. In Mexico, the hand spindle is called a malacate. Now we'll move to research done on weaving. First, looms and textile production at the missions. Harrison Rogers, a member of Jedediah Smith's party of fur traders, was staying at Mission San Gabriel in the fall of 1826, while Smith negotiated for a travel pass at the Presidio in San Diego. Rogers kept a day book describing the activities at the mission. He noted that, quote, upward of 60 women were employed in spinning yarn and others were weaving. The women were weaving wool blankets. This observation is important to our understanding of textile production in colonial California for two reasons. One, women were both spinning and weaving, and two, the level of textile production is much higher than represented by the worn and broken equipment inventoried at secularization 10 years later. Historians have frequently characterized spinning as a woman's job while weaving was a man's profession. Not in this situation, however. Since the shops at all of the Franciscan missions were organized along the same lines, it is likely that women were both spinning and weaving throughout Alta California. During the late 1700s and into the 1800s, hand looms were one basic type. 
large frame structures using a counterbalance system to raise the harnesses of the loom with pulleys and thus create a shed or opening to pass the shuttle through. The harnesses were raised using a pulley system that was operated by foot treadles. Looms in this style are still made because of the, and because of the pulley system, they tend to be very large and heavy. They sometimes are referred to as barn looms or post looms. Best example of a loom from the California period is located in New Mexico and was made around 1775. Plans from this loom were also produced by the Civilian Conservation Corps in 1941 for use at La Parisa Mission as part of the historic furnishings project. The CCC plans show a four harness, four treadle counterbalance loom. At the time the plans were made, the original loom was in a personal collection at Abiquiu, New Mexico. The loom is now held within the collection of the Albuquerque Museum. Information about this loom was provided to me by the museum curators and their measurements, you can see their little measuring tape right there, enabled me to verify that this is indeed a four harness, four treadle loom. In 2017 and 28, I'm sorry, in 2017 and 2018, Michael Sampson and I visited the California State Historic Parks that interpret textile production. We specifically wanted to look at the looms at Mission La Purissima since they were built from the CCC plans made from the 1775 New Mexico loom. We observed that the two looms at Mission La Purissima had two harnesses and two treadles. We expected to see four harnesses and four treadles. This was clarified by park staff who told us that the looms were built that way intentionally. If other looms were built to interpret this period of history, based on the Mission La Purissima looms, this misrepresentation of the 1775 loom could have spread far and wide. Indeed, we saw that the replicas at Petaluma Adobe and at Santa Barbara Presidio were made with only two harnesses and two treadles. The loom at Santa Barbara Presidio was based on the CCC plans at the Mission La Purissima archives, according to an interpretive sign next to the loom. However, during our field trip, we observed that the loom has, guess what, only two harnesses and two treadles. Therefore, it was not built according to the CCC plans, but instead replicated the two harness looms built at Mission La Purissima. This is a very important point because a two harness loom can only make plain weave fabric. And I discovered that twill fabric requiring four harnesses was also made during the California period. As all weavers know, a four harness loom can also be used to make both plain weave and twill. Another type of loom that would have been used during the Spanish and Mexican periods was the tape, also called the ribbon loom. These looms were used to make the fasteners and ties needed for almost every type of clothing, belts, ties, garters, straps, hat bands, for example. In California, wool and cotton could both have been used. So our conclusions are that an, that an authentic weaving loom representing the Spanish and Mexican periods of California history should be a counterbalance loom with four harnesses and four treadles so that both plain weave and twill could be made. The original 1775 loom in New Mexico, upon which replicas were based, was made like this. Dyes, adding color. Remember, synthetic dyes were not invented until 1856, and even then it was only the one color. While Alta California was part of the Spanish empire, the Pueblos and missions could only legally purchase fabric and dyes from the Spanish government. After Mexican independence in 1821, the goods of the world could be brought to Alta California by land and sea, including dye stuff. Requisitions and invoices from the missions and pueblos of Alta California provide us with information about the dyes used throughout our region. The imported dyes of Alta California were Brazil wood, for red and orange, 
Campeche or logwood for purple and black, indigo for shades of blue, and zacatascal for yellow. There is no evidence that cochineal grains were ever used as dye in Alta California. Brazil wood, also called sapin wood, is a tree found throughout East Asia and was used as a red dye for centuries. During colonization, a species of this tree was found native to the region now known as Brazil, in case you ever wondered why, where the name Brazil came from, it's after Brazil wood. The tree was then extensively exploited for its dye wood. The pigment Brazilian is used to create bright crimson reds and purples. Logwood is a tropical tree native to the Yucatan Peninsula and produces purple, gray, and black. It is also known as Campeche. Zacatascal is a type of parasitic daughter from Mexico and produces a yellow dye. Many species of dodder have been used historically as a dye, usually with alum as the mordant. Local wildflowers were also used by the mission dyers to produce a yellow or pale color. It is likely that indigo was imported as dry powder or chunks. The process to produce indigo for dyeing is extensive and specialized. In the 18th century, indigo was grown and processed into a form suitable for dyeing in Guatemala, Venezuela, and Mexico, but Guatemala was the main source. The production of indigo for the colonies was a major industry for Spain. Both cotton and wool are easily dyed with indigo, so it was a commonly used dye. You can see that natural dyes produce brilliant colors. Natural reds vary from salmon to brick to crimson. Since no dye house or commercial textile manufacturing operation has been identified in Old Town San Diego, these activities would have been community or home-based. Combined with the natural colors of cotton and the many colors available from the churro sheep's fleece, a little bit of dyed yarn could provide a lot of variety and color to fabric woven on the looms in the San Diego region. Let's talk a little bit now about fabric traditions made in California. Traditionally, yarn singles were used for both warp and weft fabrics. Wool utilitarian cloth was produced as yardage on a loom for everyday use. <clears throat> for work clothes, bedding, floor coverings, and blankets. The imported fabrics were used by the upper class, the military, landowners, and priests. Cotton was spun and woven for napkins, tablecloths, and towels. So what I decided to do is make interpretations of cotton and wool fabrics that would have been produced in San Diego. I dyed some of the cotton and wool yarns with the natural dyes that would have been available at the time, creating blue, yellow, red, and green yarns. Some of the yarns were made for culture embroidery, which was used by Spanish and Mexican women to repair and embellish household textiles. I also made the Sabinilla wool fabric that was the base for the culture embroidery. Then I made Bayeta fabric, which I interpreted as a fine wool, bold and suitable for many purposes. It can be quite colorful. I spun the natural colors of the churro sheet to make a blanket for a narrow bed. The blanket was made with a plain cotton warp yarn which would have been available during the interpretive period and a wool weft. To represent the cotton grown in San Diego during the early historic period, I spun and dyed brown, green, and white cotton. I made simple striped towels of the kind needed in every home. I dyed some of the cotton to add color interest. I also made hand spun cotton yardage to represent napkins and tablecloths and an apron with indigo dyed cotton and natural white and brown colored cotton. The yarn for culture embroidery was my first introduction to making historic textiles for Old Town. I was approached by park staff about spinning yarn for their project, which was to produce an altar cloth, table coverings, bed covers, and other textiles that would have been present in San Diego during the California period. Culture embroidery was originally used to repair and decorate bed covers. 
I provided the Old Town Embroidery Group with a series of samples for them to try. It was emphasized to me several times, not too thin. Traditional culture embroidery yarn is made from churro wool singles. The earliest examples were undyed natural color or indigo. After we settled on an appropriate yarn weight, not too thin, approximately 10 wraps per inch, I began producing yarns. I made light indigo, dark indigo, red, yellow, and pea green, which is indigo over pale yellow. I also spun some natural churro colors, consisting of a range from black to gray to brown to light tan. Most culture embroidery consists of floral designs, so I focused on providing colors appropriate for this use. The culture yarn is used by the Old Town Culturas in living history demonstrations. Embroidery was a traditional activity for women and is, in, and is mentioned in contempor contemporary accounts. In this photograph on the right, Senora Pico is wearing a pelerine or short cape with embroidery, and I'm guessing that she did the embroidery. Traditional culture embroidery was done on plain weave Sabania fabric made from churro singles, woven to 12 inches per inch. It's important that the fabric is loose enough to accommodate the embroidery yarn. I spun a loosely twisted churro single at 10 wraps per inch, same as the embroidery yarn. Sabania traditionally has doubled threads at the selvages. After studying examples of Sabania fabric, I produced a sample for Old Town. It turned out to be just what they wanted. After finishing it gently in soapy water, there was some tracking on the fabric. This is a desirable characteristic of Sabania and is prized by Colcheras. It creates texture and design interest in plain weave fabric. I was so excited about the Sabania success that I immediately planned to make Bayeta, the thin fabric made from wool singles that is still produced for traditional skirts. This time, I wanted lots of color. So I dyed churro singles with light and dark indigo, red and yellow. I also used some natural wool colors. I made two lengths of cloth, one with a weft of light indigo and one with dark indigo. The yarn size was the same as the Sabania fabric. The bayetta was lightly fulled or brushed, traditionally, and I processed mine the same way. The result is a colorful, light fabric, good for a light blanket or a wrap, or a warm petticoat or a child's skirt. Sayal Franciscano fabric was woven in the mission workshops to clothe the native people and monks. Sayal is the Spanish name for sackcloth, which was used for tents and horse covers. The production of this fabric in the missions was dictated to the Franciscan order in Mexico by Rome in 1688. The fabric was to be of, quote, natural, untreated, undyed, mixed white and black wool, overall gray in color. It was made from singles yarn from churro wool. I made my sample from dark brownish gray churro hand spun in the weft and a natural off-white warp which creates the mixed look dictated by the Franciscans. The native neophytes and workers wore clothes made from this and other wool fabric produced at the mission. Due to a lack of water and ability to clean and launder clothing, the wool fabric was rarely washed. In 1816, one missionary blamed the filthy wool clothing for the high mortality of the native population. Fabric and textiles were given to the native people as gifts for conversion or baptism. Although these items were often returned in disgust because of the insistence by the Padres that they wear European style clothing. And in fact, some of the Padres themselves preferred to wear imported cloth and did not like to wear the wool fabric produced by the missions. This preference is evident in the San Diego mission inventory. So, I like this statue of St. Didicus here because it looks like he's kind of showing off his Sayal Franciscano. And well, go Padres, what, what can I say about that? Unlike plain weave fabrics made in California, Herga was a twill that was made on a four harness loom. Herga was a utility fabric 
used for children's clothing and as a flexible wrapping material. It was also used for carpeting. It's a checked cloth with squares ranging from one to two inches in size. Most hergo was produced using the natural colors of the sheep, black, white, oatmeal, brown. I wove two samples, one black and white and one off-white and brown. As with all twills, it has a lot of stretch and flexibility. We made a blanket that represents California spinning and weaving for domestic use in San Diego, and it was placed on a bed at the Machado Stewart home. I wove it on a narrow loom and pieced it in three strips. The three strips contain the many natural colors of the churro sheep that were in San Diego during the early historic period. Most of the yarn in this blanket, which is a single, was spun by Michael Sampson in Old Town on a tr the traditional hand spindle. This is a bottom whirl spindle used in Mexico, where it is called a malacate, and most likely was present in Old Town during the California period. We decided to use only the natural colors of the churro sheep to show that no dyes were needed to create a decorative and useful blanket. Blankets in California were probably made with commercial cotton warp threads available at the time. This was the only way that supply could have kept up with demand. For example, General Mariano Vallejo said that his Petaluma Adobe Ranch produced 2,000 blankets a year for sale and trade in the 1830s and 1840s. And also, he was making rugs and carpets. Considering that the ratio of spinner to weaver is 10 to 1, there's no way his ranch of 3,000 sheep could have produced enough highly twisted wool warp yarn to weave this quantity of blankets. On the other hand, production of wool singles for weft yarn is pretty fast. Blankets, or mantas as they were called by Spanish and Mexican people, were needed as cloaks and for bedding. Many thousands were made in the missions, ranchos, and pueblos of California. Any extras were traded or sold to soldiers, sailors, and merchants. The production of blankets was a major activity and deserves more attention from historians, in my opinion. Wool shawls or rebozos would have been made in a manner similar to blanket production. I used wool singles in the warp for the example I made. Serapes were produced at Vallejo's workshop, and there is evidence they might have been made in San Diego. I also made some pillow tops and small table rugs to show additional designs and techniques. The difference between blankets and rugs is that the weft is packed tightly into the warp to make the hard wearing rugs. Unfortunately, there are very few actual historic textiles surviving from the Spanish and Mexican periods of California's history. I will describe three important ones. But there are other examples with good provenience, including archaeological specimens. The Machado quilt. According to the family, this quilt was made by Juana Machado Alipaste Writington around 1850. The original quilt is in the collections of the San Diego History Center, which most kindly hosted our group from Old Town to look at the quilt on June 25th, 2021. I inspected the quilt using magnifying glass and supplemental light. The base fabric for the applique appears to be the same fabric as the backing, a fine muslin. Thread irregularities are similar. The base fabric pieces are not put together the same way as the backing. It would be interesting to measure these for comparison, but of course we weren't allowed to touch it. The applique pieces, the applique pieces are made of two different red fabrics, a plain weave cotton and a fine wool 2-2 twill. The cotton pieces have faded while the wool twill is more consistent in color. The wool applique pieces have been constructed from many smaller pieces, perhaps leftovers from clothing, a shirt. Red and white thread was used to attach the applique pieces to the base fabric. The quilt binding is the same fabric as the wool twill used for the applique pieces. It's not a bias binding, but placed with the grain of the fabric. Being twill, it has a lot of flexibility to bend over the quilt edges. The wool will wear better than cotton binding. 
The binding was attached to the back of the quilt and folded over to the front where it was attached by hand stitches. The tool fabric used for the binding has some quality issues and today would be considered seconds because there's some errors in the weaving which have created weak spots. It's reasonable to refer to this twill fabric used in the quilt as flannel. This material was brought into Alta California ports. The 1840 manifest for the alert noted two bales of quote, twill scarlet flannels. This is the ship that Richard Henry Dana sailed on. The same ship also carried black and white linen thread and red flannel shirts. The 1846 Tasso Manifest noted that flannel was sold to Peter Wilder, who was the husband of Guadalupe Machado, Juana's sister. It's been suggested by some observers that Juana Machado dyed the fabric used in the quilt. Although dyeing wool fabric is relatively simple in terms of the process, cotton as a cellulose fiber is difficult to dye in a household setting. This turkey red color was produced through a lengthy process used in commercial production. By the 1840s, red cotton fabric would have been relatively inexpensive and widely available. Wool twill would have been a more expensive fabric, but was richer in color since the wool as a protein fiber would take the dye well. This difference is still observable on this quilt after all these years where the cotton fabric has worn and faded while the wool fabric retains a bright red color. A beautiful replica of the quilt was made by the Old Town Historic Quilt Guild. Thank you for doing that. This is a, a sampler um, from Monterey that's in the Daughters of the American Revolution Museum. It's an embroidered sampler dated between 1810 and 1820. Um, the embroidery is silk thread on linen. There's some white work in the sampler, but no obvious culture embroidery style. Although there are stylized floral elements, and the piece unfortunately is unsung. There's this Santa Barbara Presidio culture, culture embroidery example. Santa Barbara Presidio State Historic Park has a display panel showing what appears to be an example of culture embroidery. A citation on the panel says that the original piece is in the Los Angeles Museum of Natural History. However, when I inquired at the museum in 2018, they did not have any record of the piece, nor did they have a record of the display panel and expressed surprise that they were identified as the source. I asked if they had any California textiles, but all the examples I saw were seven serapes and one saddle blanket that were not from the California period or were made in Mexico. So I would like to close with a few comments to give perspective to the direction of textiles in Spanish and Mexican California. Who was making them? Who was making these textiles? Historic California textiles were first made by native women who were willingly or unwillingly brought to the missions and taught to use European style spinning and weaving equipment. The concepts of spinning and weaving were familiar to the native population because they're of their own heritage of textile production, as I described at the beginning of this presentation. As the California population grew into pueblos and ranchos and the missions and presidios closed, families brought textile equipment and production into the communities. Members of these families had their own knowledge and traditions of spinning and weaving from Mexico and elsewhere. We don't know who was spinning and weaving, unfortunately, but the activity must have been widespread to supply the needs of the families and community with utility textiles. And finally, the importance of blankets. The production of blankets was a critical task throughout Spanish and Mexican California. Blankets were used as outerwear during the day and as bedrolls at night. Blankets were used as trade items to exchange for food and goods. It's reasonable to conclude that the production of blankets and rugs and utility fabrics was a major activity during the California period and part of the unseen culture. But it was more than necessity. 
that kept textile production going, even as more ships supplied more diverse fabrics to California. Making cloth is a cultural expression. Hand weaving is a relationship between the weaver and the loom, and the weaver controls all aspects of the design and production of the fabric. Cloth is a source of pride and regional identity, as well as a reservoir of skill. In California, spinning and weaving was an inclusive activity that was incorporated into the life of the family and community, whether at the mission, ranchos, or in town. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. My name is Dante Faranga, and I'm the Development and Marketing Director at the San Diego Archaeological Center. As usual, I'll be moderating the Q&A portion of tonight's discussion. Just as a reminder, you can submit your questions using the Q&A feature located on your Zoom control panel, and we will try to answer as many questions as possible. I believe we have a few already. Have you looked into the collections at History San Jose for objects of this time period? Uh, my research at this point has focused on the Southern California, San Diego area um, and, and online collections because I did a lot of this research during the pandemic. And what I found was a lot of the facilities were closed, uh, unavailable, and um, I, I was very lucky to be able to have people, for example, with the Albuquerque Museum and some of the other museums willing to speak with me either over the phone or um, virtually, it, 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 I just, the pandemic kind of shut everything down as you can imagine. Can you distinguish between the spinning and weaving techniques of the native Californians and the Spanish colonials and how much do they differ? Um, it would be by material. So the, the, the native people would have used their, their traditional um, materials, plant and, and animal materials as I described previously, but in terms of the actual work, um, you can't tell the difference. I mean, it, 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 if the person is proficient, um, it, it's going to be usable material. So you can't really tell the difference by just looking at it, who, who made it in terms of whether it was made by a native person, a man, a woman, an old person, a young person. You probably tell if a child made it, but um, otherwise, if it's sound yarn, it's going to be sound yarn. Now we have a couple questions about dyes. Many of our canyons here in San Diego have blooms of yellow flowers. Were these the marigold flowers used for dyes? No, the, the marigold flower used for dyes were the Mexican marigold, the um, not the not the um, native plants that are growing here. The other thing I guess I would like to say about that is that because the tradition of dyeing was part of the, the Spanish and Mexican culture, they were using, for the most part, imported dye stuffs that were familiar to them culturally, like indigo, um, campeche, the daughters, Zacatascal. So they weren't foraging locally to get dye stuffs. I actually get asked that a lot in Old Town, you know, were they using onion skins? Were they using, you know, whatever uh, that people that people find around? So they may have used local plants to some degree, but for the most part, they were using uh, the commercially available uh, dye stuffs. So could you speak a little bit about the processes involved for producing those natural dyes? Well, actually, the wizard never tells her secrets. So no, um, what I can tell you is that there are many um, dot books with recipes for dyes, um, like any traditional dyer. Uh, you know, I take a lot of notes and I see what works and what doesn't. But but there are some very good basic. Um, uh, I don't think you'd call them texts, but but sources with recipes. I have probably several linear feet of books about dyes, and um, but but as for specifics, my lips are sealed. <laughs> right. Today's crafters use hair from various species of dogs, such as in Newfoundland. Is there any archaeological evidence of the use of dog hair 
as a source of any of the textiles in Southern California? No, and that would not have been a traditional material. Um, that's why sheep have been domesticated for thousands of years to produce um, this luxuriant fleece. Uh, there's People often ask me, well, why are there so many breeds of sheep? Well, every breed of sheep has a use. Um, every breed of sheep has different crimp, has different um, glossiness, has different thickness. That, that's what's the beautiful thing about the churro is that it's low in, in lanolin, so it doesn't require a lot of water to wash it. It's, it's um, not, not very crimpy, so it's easier to spin. In fact, some people don't like to spin it because it's almost too easy. Uh, and, and the sheep are very thrifty. They don't eat a lot of food. You can turn them out into the, into the brush and they'll do just fine. So they wouldn't have had any uh, reason to look elsewhere. Although I have to say that supposedly human hair is excellent for rope making, so it's possible that there was a little bit of that, but um, there's no direct evidence that anything uh, other than um, sheep hair or fleece was, was used. And I think you touched on this a little bit already, but have you ever seen any cross-cultural materials in collections or mission archives? like yucca processed using colonial methods? Oh, um, I, I don't think you could tell. You wouldn't be able to tell, right? I mean, if you tried to spin, for example, milkweed fiber on a hand spindle or a spinning wheel, you, rather than the traditional way of spinning it on the leg, I don't know that you could actually tell the difference. Um, again, Sound fiber is sound fiber. <clears throat> Excuse me, can you say more about the tape or ribbon looms? When would they have been used and where were they manufactured? Well, they could have been, I, I'm gonna assume they were manufactured locally. They're very simple. Um, it's, it's basically just a modified type of rigid heddle loom, but we see re requests for quote, ribbon makers. And they weren't talking about like hair ribbons or you know that kind of ribbon. They were talking about tapes. And in in at the time before zippers were invented, and knowing that that buttons had a cost, um, tying your pants or your clothing or using a tape as a garter, an apron string to tie a bundle to a cart or to a burrow, um, you can imagine all the many uses that tapes would have had and that they would have needed to be replenished. So um, as early as people were living here during the historic period, there's, uh, if you look at like museum examples on the East Coast for tape looms, they date back to, you know, prior to the American Revolution. So certainly uh, pretty early. They, but I'm assuming that they were made by the same people that were making the regular looms. And regarding the culture embroidery, what did they use for the embroidery needles? Well, needles were, were available. So by the time people were living here in, in Alta California, things like needles um, were, were broadly available and imported by the bazillion. Um, you see them in requisitions from the Santa Barbara Presidio in the late 1700s. Needles were really high, were very available. Why, like the wires for the, um, when I get asked about hand cards because they have those pads of, of wires on them. Well, wires, wires for um, that kind of product date back to the you know, 1400s. So, so they had the technology to make needles and needles were brought in again by the Brazilian on the ships. But I don't do embroidery, so I don't know what they use, but it has to have a pretty big eye, I think. <laughs> Did local production change in response to Spanish shipments being cut off? Local production change, being cut off. So I'm not quite sure that the, the textiles that were made at the mission were made from the very beginning of the establishment of the mission. Um, so 
when, as P.O. Pico said in the quote that I read, when things opened up again, um, you know, of course, trade was very restricted when the Spanish government was in control. You had to have a requisition. It had to go through an agent. It had to be shipped. Um, sometimes the ships didn't come. So there was a lot of um, unknowns about that. But then, <clears throat> as Pio Pico noted, he, he, I think he calls it, he says later, but what he means is when the Spanish government was no longer involved in, in textile trade, um, then they were able to get goods from everywhere. Although I think that they were pretty basic. Like I said, cotton muslin, uh, flannel, twill flannel, calico, that kind of thing. So my impression is that, that luxury fa fabrics were more available to some people and in some places and sometimes during the Spanish period. Um, but then uh, that, that changed when Mexico got its independence. I don't know if that answers the question or not, but. All right, I think we have time for a few more questions. Can you talk about any preferences the elite may have had for the fabric? Well, just like the elite today, um, what you can, if you can pay for it, it'll come. So uh, you would see um, in terms of imported fabrics, silks, um, and that kind of thing, anything that, that could be paid for could be obtained. I think we have photographs of people wearing and images of people wearing fancy embroidered goods. Uh, so that was that was always has always been available to the elite. Um, and, and it was no different at that time. That's what you see in the in the requisition for the mit in the inventory for the mission in 1834. There's lists of many, many different kinds of luxury fabrics. Um, one does wonder what the missions were doing with all that stuff, but but it it, it is quite amazing the diversity of textiles that they had at that time. All right. Well, thank you, Susan, and thank you to everyone for attending tonight's Living Room Lecture. For more information on our upcoming events, please visit our website at sandiegoarchaeology.org. Thank you, and have a good night. Thank you.